Okay, tonight uh, we're going to be covering uh, identity theft. Uh, my name is Derek North. I'm a premier account exec here at Federal Direct Tax Services. I'll occasionally be uh, joined by uh, Joseph Rogers, uh, another EA and uh, president here at Federal Direct Tax Services. And we're going to be going through and covering identity theft, uh, what to look for, and how to fix it. Uh, this webinar is actually going to cover the tax aspects of identity theft. Uh, not the effects that it's going to have on the credit reporting or any sort of legal procedures uh, for any recourse beyond tax-related areas. So this isn't going to cover how to handle reporting it to the credit bureaus. This is going to cover how to handle it with debt collectors. This is only going to handle the tax aspects, how to identify it, how to fix it, how to get the process started. Uh, there are numerous resources and services for reporting and handling identity theft outside of the tax system. Uh, found online or through law enforcement agencies. Uh, we will actually have a list of resources to a few of the most common ones uh, at the end of the webinar and in the slides uh, when they are published. So you can download it and access them and use them for uh, handling identity theft outside the scope of taxes. Uh, identity theft uh, at its base is the crime of obtaining personal or financial information uh, from an individual, a, a business, or some other organization uh, for the purpose of assuming that stolen identity uh, to make purchases, uh, transactions, or, or even modifications to that person's uh, permanent records uh, or financial records or anything like that. Uh, most of the uh, tax-related identity theft uh, occurs uh, in order to file an erroneous claim for a refund. Uh, the intention being to collect the refund by uh, impersonating the taxpayer. So, uh, you know, claiming uh, incorrect dependents, claiming more income, claiming more taxes, claiming credits uh, that that individual or business uh, does not qualify for in order to collect uh, that, that income. Uh, identity theft uh, recently topped the list of the IRS's dirty dozen tax scams. Uh, so that's the, the 12 most common tax scams that are actually used uh, for tax fraud purposes, and uh, identity theft is the most frequently used and fastest growing tax fraud scheme and has been for a few years now. More than 1.6 million taxpayers were victims of identity theft within just the first six months of this calendar year, which is more than the entire amount of victims for the whole of last year, of which there were roughly 1.2 million. The, the rate of growth in identity theft uh, has now dropped below 500 percent annual increase, uh, but for the past years uh, it's typically been at least a 500 percent annual increase uh, from the year prior. So it's, it's dropping a little bit more uh, from what it used to be, but the tactics that they're using are getting more and more aggressive. Uh, they include fraudulent returns to foreign addresses and extraordinarily heightened refund amounts that are much larger than people were capable of doing in the past. The uh, IRS has decreased the amount that they pay out from fraud, uh, but they still had to stop roughly $12 billion in erroneous refunds for just the first half of this year. Uh, following TIGTA, and TIGTA is the inspector general that, that governs the, the enforcement of the IRS's own standards, uh, following their suggestions, uh, the IRS was actually able to prevent as much fraud as possible during the year uh, with the erroneous payments uh, only totaling out $3.6 billion, which is uh, a lot less than the $5.2 billion paid out the year prior. Uh, and that's keeping in mind that there was still $12 billion that was actually, uh, that was actually stopped. So we're talking you know, over $15 billion in erroneous claims to refund. They stopped roughly 80% of it. but. Uh, almost $4 billion of it managed to, to squeeze its way through the system and get paid out to people. Now, this problem, while it is getting easier to fix on the IRS's side, is still just the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. These tactics, like I said, are expected to increase in aggression and frequency. Uh, it's considered the, that this is probably going to get worse or the criminals that are responsible for it are going to get more clever. Uh, the taxpayer action. Uh, is still the best and the most effective tool for combating identity theft due to the individualized attention that can be given to the issue. Uh, we'll cover a little bit uh, the IRS's response, uh, how well they're capable of handling it, how on top of things they are, and the, the, the short of it is, is that they're, they're not quite as good at it as they could be, 
they're better than they used to be, but taxpayer action is easily the, the number one most effective way for this process to get started, to, to stop it before it becomes an issue, and to change anything that may have been compromised during the theft of, of the person's identity. The consequences of identity theft are, are very, very numerous. Uh, it's, identity theft is rampant. Uh, there are a lot of different things that can happen to a person financially and, and related to taxes uh, from identity theft. Uh, the first list right here is a potential placement into the wrong tax bracket, which gives you problems for student loans, debt control, health insurance, and uh, other programs based on income. Uh, a lot of the things that you'll be able to apply for, like student loans, public assistance, uh, getting payment plans on your debt, a lot of those are going to be dependent upon what your income is considered uh, to those organizations. And having uh, the identity theft and possibly a, a heightened income amount could throw a roadblock into any of those uh, applications, especially if the taxpayer is unaware that it's been going on. Uh, the incorrect reporting of taxes owed, and those can carry forward into social programs like Medicare and Social Security. Uh, you could have somebody using your ID to you know, report wages and uh, have a whole bunch of different uh, income that's listed, and by the time you come around to get Medicare and Social Security, the, all the numbers are messed up, and, and the taxpayer has to you know, go seek remediation and, and find a way to fix it, and this process can be extraordinarily complex and time-consuming. Uh, the delays can, that can come from financial records being compromised through identity theft can potentially take years to fix. Uh, there are several people that we have talked to that have been victims of this uh, who you know, have three or four years down where they've actually had to spend multiple years contacting all of the appropriate agencies, uh, the IRS, making sure that uh, everything is everything's squared away. Uh, so this is a, a really big problem is the amount of time that it can cause uh, for a taxpayer to take care of. And as well, we just got the general inconvenience and the emotional duress that comes from dealing with the problem. Uh, many of your uh, clients out there are going to be uh, you know, working families. They might not have the time in the middle of the day to call during business hours and be on the phone for four hours talking to somebody uh, to fix one of these issues. So it can cause a lot of stress, a lot of inconvenience, and a lot of problems uh, once it comes down to the time that it takes to actually handle these things. Uh, the incorrect reporting of wages and claims to refund can plague taxpayers for years. Some people might not even be aware of a problem until they get letters from the IRS that indicates an audit or taxes owed. Uh, there's a little bit of emphasis on that, you know, with the exclamation point, and the fact is that the IRS does not do real time uh, at the exact second uh, following up on audits. Sometimes they let things sit. They can let a, an account grow with the, uh, with the interest and the penalties and until a, a time that they decide to handle it. And you know, somebody might be out using somebody's social security number, reporting income. Maybe it's an older person that does not uh, realize they have to file most of the time because they do social security. Somebody's uh, reporting lots and lots and lots of dependents and, and income, and then suddenly uh, grandma gets a letter. Uh, you know, it says, hey, you haven't uh, been paying your taxes for the last three years. Uh, we need this now. And you know, there she is, incapable of handling it, has no idea that it happened. Uh, many people find out about identity theft. This is probably the most common way they find out when the return is rejected in the uh, e-file system. Uh, the the e-file system is tied to the exemption and the social security number. So the, the social security number for the taxpayer, when it is used, whether uh, on the return as a primary or as a dependent, it gets locked out of being e-filed. Uh, it can only be paper filed at that point. And many taxpayers will file a return expecting to have it process and you know get their get their refund within a week or two, uh, only they get a call from their tax preparer saying, "Hey, uh, did you go somewhere else and file, or you know, are you aware that you're dependent on somebody else's return?" Uh, so this is easily the number one way that most people find out that they uh, actually have had their identity stolen. Uh, since the IRS is limited in resources and many local enforcement agencies and police stations are, are overburdened, uh, the issue can occur without them ever being notified. Uh, this is true in particular for individuals who would have no requirement to file, so senior citizens, students, and uh, other people who make too little to be required to report it. Uh, identity theft is also often used with the information uh, from homeless people or wards of the state under no obligation to file individually. It's a, another common tactic is using socials uh, from the uh, homeless community to uh, artificially inflate refunds so that the preparer can collect the bulk of it uh, potentially even gaining 
those social security numbers from the homeless or from the wards of the state under false pretexts of a, uh, a credit or something, something similar. Uh, being overburdened, the IRS is often completely incapable of pursuing cases quickly on their own. Uh, for calendar year 2012, when they reported over 1.1 million cases of identity theft, uh, this number is already over 1.6 million for this year. It's only going to get worse the closer we get to December. And as of the November 7th release from TIGTA, so just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the IRS has sped up their procedure from case handling and has dropped their average time. So they're, they're averaging 277 days to, to take care of one of these issues. So it's 277 days is the default time that you can expect this to be resolved. And that is down from 470 days uh, last year and the years prior. This is a substantial improvement, but I mean, we are still talking about you know, two-thirds of the year right there. You know, so that's somebody coming into file in January and not being able to have the issue resolved until maybe uh, Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas. You know, this is, a, this is a, a really big issue. And even with that 277-day average, they were still not, according to TIGDA's guidelines, able to satisfy uh, those cases in about 25% of the time. So a quarter of the cases that they did fix uh, were not actually done to the satisfaction of the general guidelines. So they were missing some aspect or they didn't actually completely fix the problem, uh, you know, just kind of tossed under the bus and forgot about it. In addition to the conflicting nature of finding assistance for the problem, the IRS actually uses very little of the data that they get to create and follow trends in order to prevent and screen cases. Uh, taxpayers are often asked to validate their own identity during this procedure multiple times, uh, either through the mail or over the phone, uh, and that can run into difficulties uh, as the IRS now has uh, incorrect information to use. You know, they, they might ask you over the phone, they might have you send in documents three or four times, get them notarized. You know, there are multiple steps that can provide an inconvenience for taxpayers who are trying to get this taken care of. And they're, they're not very on top of the, the trends following where it's going. There are some enforcement areas that will that will touch that they that they're primarily focusing on, but in reality, they're they're not using any of their internal data tracking metrics uh, in order in order to try to screen these things before they become a problem. So even though the IRS is able to achieve a near 100% success rate in determining the correct owner of a social, their case handling still faces problems. So I, I mentioned that they have a 25% rate where you know they're not able to satisfactorily solve it. Uh, they're capable of almost 100% of the time identifying the correct uh, social security number uh, to the correct person, but their case handling still has a lot of issues. Uh, there's uh, an overburdening and a high rate of case inactivity. Uh, with currently over 95,000 cases that are just overstated on their docket and are left inactive. So that's 95,000 people who are just hanging in the wind waiting for some enterprising IRS agent uh, in order to open it up and, and see what steps need to be taken. Something as simple as looking at a letter that was provided and giving it the go-ahead. Uh, something as simple as a switching income from one account to another. Uh, and the IRS uh, currently receives about 80 million phone calls during the year, uh, during the tax season primarily, uh, many of which are part of the identity theft resolution process. And with the fiscal challenges uh, from Congress due to the, the shutdown and the, the expected shutdown that might be coming in January and the delay in the, in the tax season, this can only increase the difficulty for resolution. But despite these shortcomings, uh, the IRS has taken a lot of TIGTA's assessments to heart and have formulated a, a measured approach to addressing the issues uh, with uh, identity theft. Uh, one of them that they're trying to do is they're trying to establish some form of accountability for identity theft. Uh, they want to have the ability to have this tracked on an individual basis, assigned to specific people. Uh, they're in the process of implementing that, uh, you know, budget willing. Uh, they want to establish better guidelines for correspondence, so taxpayers are, are notified when the IRS receives identity documents uh, and make sure that notices are not accidentally sent to the criminal responsible. It, it is a, a common problem that notices are sent to the address on the return even after it's been identified as a as fraudulent identity and that the criminal fabricates the, the proof and you know just obfuscates the problem by uh, pretending to be the taxpayer a second time. Uh, and the IRS is also working to create and maintain programs and departments to screen, analyze, and act upon the data received. Once again, these are really all subject to budget constraints at the moment. So far, these improvements have led to a slow but sure rise in the punishment 
or the criminals that are responsible. Uh, so within the last three years, the IRS has gone from 86.7% uh, incarceration rate to 100% incarceration rate in all pursued cases. So when they actually pursue a, a legal uh, solution to identity theft and find the person responsible, they have been successful 100% of the time within the last three years in actually getting these people uh, charged and sentenced. Additionally, up until the accounts management section of the IRS is subdivided into a dedicated identity theft group, the uh, Taxpayers Advocate Service has been given guidelines and instruction on how to assist taxpayers in actually fixing these issues that stem from identity theft. And for those of you who don't know or have no experience or this is your first year with us, uh, the Taxpayers Advocate Service is a, is a free advocacy service that is available for taxpayers. They're sort of uh, your best friends. Uh, behind the phone. Uh, they're the ones that you uh, contact when you have an issue and you're not having them represented by, uh, in, by an enrolled agent. These are the people that are going to walk with the taxpayer and try to set up payment arrangements and, and try to pursue solutions uh, to common tax problems. So I've mentioned before funding problems, potential funding blocks for the advocacy service just like everything else. It really just depends upon legislative action. Uh, the recent shutdown furloughed uh, roughly 80 percent of the IRS's uh, department uh, and that includes people in the advocacy service. Even though they're beneficial taxpayers, uh, everything's potentially on the chopping block uh, depending upon what Congress decides to do next. There are new penalties uh, for tax-related identity theft. The Stopping Tax Offenders and Prosecuting Identity Theft Act, uh, H.R. Uh, 4362, uh, adds tax fraud to an uh, aggravated identity theft label, uh, two to five year mandatory sentencing guidelines. Uh, it attempts to protect the most vulnerable groups, so uh, veterans, seniors, and minors. And the uh, enforcement is uh, being targeted to high volume fraud areas. Uh, Florida, uh, easily the number one hotspot in the country for fraud, particular Miami. Uh, and foreign addresses, uh, you see like notes right there, thousands of returns to Lithuania, Shanghai. Uh, a lot of people will have multiple returns sent to the same address without uh, an internal data tracking that identifies uh, the number of returns going to a particular address that might go unnoticed until somebody audits uh, later within the IRS and finds out that uh, in this case there were several thousands of returns sent individually to each uh, addresses in Lithuania, Shanghai, and in some cases uh, hundreds or even thousands of returns sent to single addresses in uh, Florida, Miami being of uh, particular note. Uh, when you actually have uh, identity theft as a problem, there are a series of first steps that you're going to want to do uh, to identify it and start the process for res resolution as early as possible. It can take years in the worst scenarios to correct stolen identity and the tax consequences, so the earlier that you get a bead on it, uh, the better. Uh, the first indicator of a stolen identity typically comes, like I said before, when you're attempting to file a return electronically. Uh, since the social security numbers, the, the TIN, the tax ID number, uh, can only be used once, the e-file system will kick it back. Uh, if you've been preparing returns for uh, at least a year, uh, you'll, find, you'll know that roughly one out of every five returns gets rejected at least one time. Uh, social security numbers uh, being taken, uh, typos with social security numbers, very common uh, reason for rejections. And it specifies that it has been used in a previously accepted tax return. Like I said, this is the first, uh, the first line of defense against finding out if it's ID theft. Uh, less frequently, uh, the taxpayer will be notified of identity theft when they receive correspondence from the IRS, uh, indicating an attempt to collect taxes, initiate an audit, or wanting to validate some sort of credit, uh, identity, or deduction on return. So if you have a, you know, an old lady who, who's never had to file uh, in the last like 10 years, she collects Social Security, no requirement, no taxes paid, and uh, suddenly she comes into your office with a letter asking her to verify three dependents on the return, that's a, a fairly good indication uh, that somebody out there has used her social, has put some kids on it, uh, inflated the refund, and tried to collect. Uh, once you've received suspicion uh, that a taxpayer has had their identity stolen, the very first steps are, are what we like to call a necessary evil in order to confirm uh, you know, what you have uh, suspected. Uh, because the reason for this is that some taxpayers attempt to double dip. They'll try to file several returns in the hope of getting multiple refunds. Uh, this was kind of a, a, a possibility in the past with the, when the e-file system was uh, in its infancy when the IRS started really requiring people to do this with the ERS or IRS e-file mandate. 
Uh, but now with the uh, modern e-file system in, in full swing, uh, it makes this almost impossible uh, by a virtue of the social security number being tied up. Uh, there's only one attempt that it can go through. And if a return's accepted, any paper filed returns that get sent into the IRS, uh, unless there's some sort of cover letter or there's an amendment, uh, they just throw the return away. Uh, immediately, they don't even look at it. So do, double dipping is not really something that happens anymore, but people who have done it in the past or attempted to do it in the past may still attempt to do it, go file somewhere else, come to your office and attempt to do the exact same thing. Uh, and then the, another thing is that taxpayers may also have been uh, shopping around for better deals. If they go to the competitors, they, they get to the end, they see the price. Uh, since, a lot of, since a lot of tax offices do forms-based pricing, uh, you know, there's no idea how much it's going to cost until the end's done and all the forms are on the return. So they may or may not have had their return submitted elsewhere. And it may or may not be considered identity theft, uh, depending entirely on the circumstances. So in order to figure out if a return was submitted by another taxpayer, you have to take these necessary evil steps. Uh, you got to ask questions that pertain to the prior visits. You know, did they sign any paperwork? You know, if they signed paperwork, it's a, pos it's a possibility that the return may have been filed legally, uh, and that their only recourse at that point would be to go back to the original preparer and work with them to resolve whatever issue that they may be having. You know, if they signed off on the return, if they signed that 8879, you know, that gives the taxpayer, uh, you know, that gives them a window uh, in order to file the return. Uh, there is a, a penalty that you can have applied if you do not file a, a, a return. It's a stockpile rule. Uh, the IRS has waived those last year. Uh, they probably are going to do that this year. So there's not necessarily a time constraint to file when the 8879 it is signed in most cases. Uh, so you know, many many times, uh, you know, a person goes and they sign the paperwork, uh, decide, oh, I'm going to go somewhere else, and in the meantime the preparer they went to originally, e-files it, it's accepted, and if they signed off on it, then there's really nothing that you as a preparer can do. That issue is entirely with them and the original ERO. Uh, if they signed off on the original return and it was incorrect, uh, they, I mean, they, made to, they may need to amend the return to fix the problem, uh, but that's something that is outside the scope of this webinar. Uh, and if they did sign the paperwork somewhere else, did the return uh, that was submitted have any changes after the fact, like additional credits or deductions to increase the refund without their consent. Uh, this isn't technically identity theft when it happens, but it is common in the occurrence that a taxpayer's return was submitted without their, uh, without their knowledge beforehand and the return's rejected. Uh, a lot of times, you know, they will submit the return and, and inflate it and, and have a really high prep fee in order to carve off a larger slice. It gets rejected in your office. And then uh, usually later they get uh, letters from the IRS asking to justify some of the things that they may or may not have put on it. Uh, it's also outside of the scope of the webinar, uh, but this uh, frequently occurs side by side. So a uh, word of advice uh, to taxpayers if they come into your office is to not sign anything unless they intend on it being sent. So unless they, uh, unless they want it or uh, agree to it going off, they don't need to sign it, that 8879, is the, uh, is the permission for them to file your return with your signature being equated to a PIN number. If they sign it, taxpayer is good to go, or the tax preparer is good to go. So is the issue for, uh, for this a dependent on another return? Is there something that says that the uh, dependent filed their own return or uh, that they're being claimed on another return? Uh, something like this is also not automatically uh, indicative of identity theft. Uh, issues with claiming dependents from uh, parents or caretakers that you know file separate returns or they, they rush to claim the kid early in the season uh, can lock that social the same way it would for a taxpayer uh, from being on the return. So you need to identify, you know, is is this dependent or are they being claimed on another person's return? And if so, is that because they were had identity theft stolen or is it because another parent went and uh, do what we like to call ninja uh, and, and you know sneak them out and claim them first? Uh, because the so because the TIN number and the uh, the exemption are locked. So the first person to claim it gets it. Uh, whether that's challenged later is immaterial. As far as e-filing is concerned, the, the first time that that gets submitted is, is what, what locks it into place. So you want to make sure to ask uh, you know, the necessary evil questions to, to you know, make sure, is there someone else who can claim the kid? Is there anybody else who has a valid reason to claim the kid? Uh, and then start looking at the reject codes you know, when they come in. 
if you've got a you know a ten year old on a return and it says they filed their own return, that's a pretty good a pretty good indication of identity theft. It's not like your uh, your uh, elementary school dependent is going to be going out and filing their own tax return, you know. But if you have somebody who's a, a little bit older, a college student, and you filed the return and it says you know taxpayers filed their own return elsewhere, you know that right there is is worthy of those due diligence, those uh, best practices questions asking, are you sure that they just didn't go out and file their own return themselves? Uh, once you've, once you've uh, ascertained the validity of this identity theft, you know, the, the logic would dictate that a taxpayer should contact the IRS directly. But since identity theft guidelines are not standardized internally, this can actually lengthen the time to fix the problem because of uh, incorrect guidance, uh, conflicting statements, and uh, junior preparers and uh, IRS agents on the other side. Uh, the IRS is not internally homogenous. Uh, there are people who have 20 years experience. There are people who are in completely different departments. And in a lot of cases, uh, with call volume really high and the, the lessened funding and lessened employees, uh, a lot of calls will spill over. Uh, into into other departments, uh, people who have no idea about some aspect uh, of, uh, of of this tax concern. So if the, you have somebody who's working for the IRS uh, handling general account questions, who's never handled identity theft in the past without any sort of internal guidelines, they might give the taxpayer some conflicting information or accidentally increase the length of time that it's going to take to solve this problem by maybe putting flag on the return or uh, changing information in the system that makes it more difficult for the taxpayer to verify who they are a little bit later. Usually, the IRS will request a properly completed form 14039 and mention obtaining a police report, uh, but that step itself can also run into problems. And we will cover uh, both aspects of this uh, in the following slides. So reporting identity theft, uh, the, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission has guidelines that they post for reporting identity theft on their website. Without going into too much detail over the, the specifics of it, the procedure usually is contacting credit bureaus to place fraud alerts on the account, closing any at-risk or tampered with accounts, filing a complaint with the FTC, and filing a police report. The police report is often the uh, most difficult of the steps to accomplish, and it's also usually the only one that the IRS is going to possibly ask for. It's not required on a, on a proper form 14039, uh, but they may require it in future correspondence. Uh, like I did mention, they might have them verify who they are, verify it multiple times. Uh, having a copy of the police report might be a necessary step uh, in you know, one of these uh, resolution cases as, as they're going down. Uh, many local police departments do allow reporting identity uh, theft cases, and this should be done primarily in person. Uh, doing it fax, email, or internet is a lower priority. Uh, it might be occasionally possible. If you are in a, a city with a, a large uh, internet presence, uh, it might be possible to pull this off. You know, cities that have like uh, good Wi-Fi networks or integrated their services with the police reporting with uh, some sort of electronic database. In a lot of places in the country, though, it's just going to require uh, you know foot in boots, uh, you know, person inside the police station. And if the police station is reluctant to take the report because you know, maybe they consider it a low priority or the, the clerk behind the desk doesn't want to do the paperwork or what have you, uh, then you might get away with being able to file just a miscellaneous incident report or uh, the, the closest version that that police station has in order to identify the issue. That in many cases will be what happens, especially in smaller police stations, where a miscellaneous incident report just kind of gets uh, stuck on the back burner, and uh, unless it gets tied into a later criminal case, uh, it'll just sort of get ignored, but the taxpayer will be able to have it to prove that they at least made a good faith effort to uh, contact law enforcement and, uh, and identify that their, that their identity had been stolen or compromised in some sense. Uh, getting a police report can be very important in the future for handling identity theft, not just in tax issues, but in all of the incidents that come from the initial theft of that person's identity. And I've got a, a slightly humorous bullet point here, seriously advise obtaining a police report. I can't stress that enough. Advise obtaining a police report. If they don't like police, that's perfectly fine. You can usually pick up the miscellaneous incident report, uh, fill it out on your own time, drop it off, and be done with it. As long as they have a copy of it, it's going to help them out uh, whenever somebody asks for it. It also provides credence to that taxpayer's case when they do that at the same time that they start trying to solve the problem. It's a lot better if they get that done in the beginning than waiting five, six months down the road and then finally taking care of it after they've already you know, started the process with the IRS and with the credit bureaus and with the FTC. 
So while the above steps are important to discuss, the primary step for the tax purposes uh, in order to, in order to uh, get this taken care of is uh, filling out the Form 14039 uh, Identity Theft Affidavit. Uh, this affidavit is used to report identity theft in three different cases. The first one is that the taxpayer is a victim and that their tax records are currently being affected. So that's when you know, somebody has already filed a claim for a refund, somebody is already using your social security number. That's a very common thing with the undocumented workers that are working under somebody else's social security number. Uh, that income's being attributed to the owner of the social and not the person who is actually doing the work. Uh, the second one is taxpayer is a victim and their tax records are potentially at risk in the future. So you've had an identity theft for some issue not related to taxes, and you believe that it is possible that the, the taxpayer's records are at risk in the future because of uh, some unrelated tax uh, you know, identity theft issue. Uh, and then the taxpayer is a potential victim and their records are potentially at risk in the future. So this is one of those situations where yeah, you know, you, you're part of a, an, maybe you're on part of an online website that you have your, your name and your, your personal account information in, and suddenly you find out a, a group of hackers compromised the database and stole a bunch of uh, credit card numbers. You know, it's one of those things where you don't know for certain that you are a victim, you don't know for certain uh, whether or not anything's going to happen with it, but you fill out the form and send it in basically saying, really low priority, keep an eye uh, on uh, keep an eye on my uh, on my situation and make sure that the, nothing's happening uh, with my records. Make sure there's no claims, no changes that are that are not basically uh, authorized by me. <clears throat> when you fill out the form, you have to identi identify which one of those categories that the taxpayer belongs in, and uh, basically check the box that corresponds with it. And after this, you pretty much follow the fields and fill them in with the date of the incident and the uh, tax years that are impacted or expected to be impacted, uh, the last tax year that the taxpayer filed, and the personal information like current mailing address, address on the last return filed, phone number. Uh, as much information as you can possibly fill out, uh, it's fairly simple. You just follow it line by line and enter the information that it asks for. Uh, when you are filling out the form, you only place the last four digits of the uh, taxpayer social or the full nine digits of an ITIN number for your undocumented workers if they have one. That last four digits prevents uh, anything from being intercepted. You know, it could be possible that uh, them completing the form uh, is because they had their, their records intercepted. Maybe that criminal is still capable of intercepting. Uh, you don't want them to you know, open it up and have uh, access to the full social security number on yet another piece of information that they can use. Uh, I-10 holders, on the other hand, full nine digits. Uh, you don't need to put only the last four. Uh, the form is also going to ask for best time to call and a preferred language of communication. Uh, typically, uh, these are going to be between English and Spanish, but you do have the ability to write in a different language on the form, and the IRS can have a translator uh, actually contact that person, somebody who's capable of speaking a language, uh, whether it's you know like German, French, or uh, Middle Eastern language like Arabic or uh, Farsi. You know they they have the ability to contact the taxpayer in a language that they prefer. Uh, usually, you're going to be between English and Spanish. Those are the ones that have the fastest return time. When the form is complete, the taxpayer is also going to be required to attach photocopies of their identity documentation. Uh, this is also a good place for them to get a photocopy of the police report uh, if one is present. Even though it doesn't specifically ask for one, it's always a good idea to put it in there. It might help expedite the process when you send the form in. Uh, acceptable copies of identity documents for this form include passports, uh, driver's licenses, uh, social security cards or uh, uh, ITIN acceptance letters, or other valid U.S. federal or state government issued ID. Uh, by default, Photocopies of the documents are, uh, n they're not required to be notarized. You don't need to go to a notary public and have them notarized in order to take care of. If you want to do that for uh, just the sake of uh, completion, by all means, uh, go ahead. Uh, notarizing is not really too terribly expensive, uh, but it's not required when you send these documents in. And only one copy is necessary to be attached to the form. And when I say uh, attached, by the way, I want to point out, uh, anytime you see something attached to a form that goes to the IRS, uh, do not staple it. Do not paper clip it. Uh, you pretty much put everything in loose leaf. Uh, that's just a requirement they pretty much have for most things that get sent to them. Uh, the, the, that applies in this case as well. 
So when you mail the completed uh, 14039, the first consideration is either to uh, send it to the address or to the fax number that's listed on the correspondence. Uh, the form should be submitted with all attaches and a copy of the return if the taxpayer hasn't already filed the return when it's sent. So if you have you know, filed the return and it gets rejected, and they find out it's identity theft, complete the form, get all the documents, get all the photocopies that you need, and then uh, have a copy of the completed form, print it, sign it, and have them sent in. And maybe even with a cover letter that explains the situation. This way, everything that needs to be done from the proper filing of the return, the proper uh, address to send the address or direct deposit to send the refund to, the proper way to handle that return, and all of the identity theft are all in one convenient place, and nobody from the identity theft division has to go contact the, the general IRS agents who are handling the return. Uh, you know, there's none of that. It's all in one place. They can get it to where they need it to go, and it, it expedites the process significantly. If the taxpayer does not have an IRS notice, uh, and therefore doesn't have a, a fax or an address specifically listed, uh, then they basically uh, file the form and all the attachments to the place that they would have normally sent their return. So if you're doing this in response to a letter that the IRS has given you, uh, either justifying a claim to a refund or verifying a dependent on a return or something similar, uh, then you're going to respond uh, to the notice that's provided. That's actually just good advice in general. If you get a notice from the IRS, it will typically have a contact point on it. If you send it anywhere other than that, you're just only going to throw a, a stick in the cog. You know, you want, you want to be able to send it to where they want it to go if they've already attached it to a person to handle it. And if you don't have an IRS notice, then you just simply go uh, through a partner portal or uh, you know, through a search online and find out where you're supposed to mail the return uh, if it were to have just been paper filed in the first place and send everything in and they will get it to the appropriate division. If the taxpayer has already filed the return and they're sending the Form 14039 by itself, the return must be sent with a letter that's attached explaining the situation to the best of their ability. That's got to be sent to the same address that they would have normally sent the return for the taxpayer's uh, state of residence. So if you've already filed a return, e-filed, it uh, doesn't matter, get a copy of it, send it with the 14039 cover letter explaining exactly what's supposed to be going on, why you're sending a copy of the return in, so that way you can try to identify like, hey, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, this is my actual return, I think there's something going on, with my identity theft, with taxes, this is what's supposed to be done right here. If there's any changes, they're not authorized. That's essentially what it's for. And while the form uh, can be faxed in response to the IRS, uh, it is important to note that the IRS only initiates first contact via post mailings. They never initiate through email or fax because of the potential risk associated with it. So unless the client has an existing relationship with the IRS because of a prior audit or a prior callback time or something completely different, uh, the IRS will never email. If somebody comes and says, yeah, I got a, an IRS email, the answer is no. They got contacted by a spammer. Uh, plain and simple, they got contacted by somebody who's attempting to get their personal information. The IRS uh, does not want to contact anybody through any reason other than post mailings. Uh, as a side note, that's also why you need to have a valid, uh, a valid mailing address on every return that you file for every client. For situations like this, they only send letters to the address that's on the return. They only initiate through mail. And if the taxpayer never put a good address on it, they may have a notice that was already sent uh, regarding this issue. They find out their identity stolen, but since they never put a real address on it, uh, the IRS already judged against them or moved on, and now you've just thrown two months, three months, four months into, uh, into the, the, the resolution process. And if the taxpayer is filing the form on the potential risk of identity theft, they haven't gotten any correspondence, uh, you know, maybe their wallet gets stolen, they want to cover their bases, they want to try to forestall potential problems because uh, you know, a website's uh, contact information and credit card numbers were stolen. Uh, instead, they can mail the form uh, to the uh, Andover, Massachusetts office uh, for the IRS that's listed here. Uh, when we publish this within the next uh, few days, uh, that will be available inside the, uh, the printout of the of the webinar slides, so that way you guys can uh, keep that as a reference. Um, this is the same department that also handles uh, uh, background checks and identity verification for the uh, IRS e-services. Uh, so it's kind of what they do is double checking and going through uh, various databases and background checks to make sure 
uh, that there isn't going to be some sort of a potential problem. Alternately, a uh, taxpayer can fax a completed form to that number. Likewise, going to be available in the slides when they're published. Uh, faxing that number uh, might possibly be the best way that gets handled. Um, IRS doesn't use a digital fax line. Uh, they're a little bit behind time. Uh, so it's always possible that uh, it gets lost in translation. Uh, can't guarantee uh, that you get a response back. So always make sure that when, you, when you're faxing something that you're waiting for a response letter. Uh, from it that verifies that it's printed uh, on their side, verifies that they did receive it. In either case, regardless whether you fax it, regardless whether you mail it, uh, once the form has been submitted and reviewed, the end goal is basically uh, the exact same. Uh, the IRS is going to uh, issue correspondence that gives taxpayer a six-digit identity protection pin on what's known as a CP01A letter. Those six digits will need to be present on any future electronically sent returns in order for the returns to be accepted. Okay? Now, these letters are sent out uh, pretty much every year. And, uh, you know, so uh, like the, the number is not necessarily consistent year to year. Uh, the taxpayers uh, who try to file that have had identity theft issues in the beginning of the year might get rejected because they believe it was a one-off situation. Until this, the IRS stops mailing the letter and identifies that they've, uh, you know, handled the problem and that this PIN number is not necessary, uh, they will send a CP01A out in the beginning of January for every year that the taxpayer will need to bring in and have with them and that number in order to file. If you're using uh, you know, the, the desktop or the professional versions of the software, this is the, the number field, the PIN number, that's actually located right above the preparer information uh, on the bottom of the main information sheet that you use to put it in there. Uh, anybody else, uh, if you're filing returns and you have identity theft issues and you're using the interview-based software, uh, make sure to put the ID protection PIN uh, in the notes when you send the return so that way we can have it on there when the return actually, uh, actually gets submitted. Finally, if the current tax records are being affected by the theft, a correspondence between the IRS and taxpayer will eventually lead to the situation being fixed. So the refunds will be correctly distributed, records fixed, and upon receipt of the PIN number, the prevention uh, from identity theft in the future for the taxpayer. Uh, it's important to always uh, you know, double check, have the taxpayer double check and make sure that the corrections made are uh, to their satisfaction. I did mention that it's about 25% of the time it's not done according to, uh, you know, take his guidelines for uh, satisfactorily resolving the issue. And basically, uh, you know, once everything's said and done, it's always a good idea to make sure that the taxpayer gets a copy of the transcript, a copy of the records from the IRS, just to make sure uh, that the return itself uh, actually has been properly taken care of, that their tax records have been uh, fixed. And it's one of those things that you can offer your additional services to, to overview it and make sure that the IRS hasn't accidentally uh, wiped out a, a completely valid credit or uh, shorthanded the, the taxpayer during the process of resolving the issue. So it's important to note that beyond helping fill out the form and preparing the taxes that are associated with it is that you won't be able to correspond directly with the IRS on behalf of this client without being an enrolled agent. Uh, an attorney, CPA, uh, enrolled actuary, or re enrolled retirement plan agent. Um, the third-party designee on the return, it's possible you might get a very forgiving IRS agent who's capable of, of discussing the issue briefly with you, but unless you have a professional certification that allows you to practice before the IRS in, a, in the capacity of representation and a properly filled out power of attorney, uh, you will not be able to talk to the IRS, so you will not get to be the middleman. Uh, this will be something that they have to handle on their own. So unless they have you on a, a three-way call where the IRS agent can, can verify that the taxpayer is there and listening, it's very unlikely without those certifications uh, that you'll actually be able to be directly involved beyond doing the tax return and filling out the Form 14039 with the taxpayer. Uh, for taxpayers without representation services, whether they decided not to use the Sure and Secure uh, service that's offered through our returns, uh, or taxpayers who had the issue prior to being qualified for those who are not going through uh, representation uh, with us or with yourselves, if you're capable of doing so, uh, or people that would rather just correspond with the IRS themselves and handle it on their own, can be directed to the taxpayer's advocate service. Uh, that number right there, 877-777-4778, goes to the uh, taxpayer's advocate. Uh, typically, it's got a pretty decent hold time on it. Uh, the taxpayers advocate are very helpful. Uh, it's their entire purpose is to basically serve as uh, internal affairs 
for the IRS in relation to taxpayer issues. They're the people that uh, you want to send a taxpayer to if you can't offer a resolution service. Uh, they will help try to fix problems. And uh, they do have identity theft guidelines to provide a little bit more assistance than just calling the regular 800-829-1040 number. Now, uh, the future of identity theft, the scope and intensity of this will likely continue to increase. The more integration with digital services, uh, the more ubiquitous that problems with uh, you know, hackers or malware or viruses or anything accessing uh, databases of client information, uh, this is only going to get worse. The rate might slow down, but the criminals uh, in desperation, backs against the wall, might come up with ever more ingenious ways to actually do this identity theft. They might tone down the amount uh, and make it so under the radar that nobody knows about it for a really long time. Uh, you know, this is something that is uh, you know, only going to increase in frequency as the future continues on. Hopefully, the IRS is going to follow TIGTA's procedures and, uh, are, and follow them for future enforcement more uh, than they already have. Uh, you know, hopefully, they have some internal data tracking. And uh, some of the other uh, you know, service bureaus and, and banks in the country use things like LexisNexis and, and credit monitoring services in order to double check the number of times uh, you know, that returns are filed or uh, that inquiries are made. Hopefully, they will utilize something similar that will actually allow them to catch this before it becomes an issue, maybe stop preparers who are facilitating in these types of scenarios. Uh, before it becomes a problem for a large number of taxpayers. Uh, there are future laws that are already on the books. Uh, Senator Nelson uh, actually had the, his own version of the law stalled in the Senate last year. Uh, essentially, he's trying to take a hard-line approach and get it passed through the Senate. Um, with the legislative changes in the gridlock in both the House and the Senate over even the most minor of issues, I doubt very highly that this is going to be something that actually gets addressed legally uh, within the next few years. Uh, and Final point is that taxpayer vigilance and uh, preparer assistance, uh, your persistence with this issue will be the key to protection against identity theft issues uh, for the foreseeable future. We do have a list of resources here. Uh, when it does get printed out, uh, the identity theft guidelines uh, and hotline for the FTC are right there. Uh, they, they, I mean, if you did a if you did a search on the internet, you'd probably find that link up there at the top to the FTC.gov's website is the number one the number one site. Uh, otherwise, they can call eight seven seven ID theft. That's something that they do that's non tax related. Uh, those people exist to walk uh, regular uh, you know tax paying citizens through the process of getting these things uh, attributed and, and fixed. Uh, taxpayer advocate uh, websites there. Form fourteen zero three nine fillable online, and then the IRS's ID theft toolkit right there. These will all be in the slides when they get published within the next day or so. Hey, fantastic. Derek, thanks a lot for the presentation there. That was great. I'll, uh, I've got a bunch of questions that came through uh, while, while you were going through that that uh, uh, I can bring up and I, I want to put out there so that everybody can, can kind of benefit from these. Um, and, and first one that I had that came through that I thought was uh, noteworthy here is um, – Talking about identity theft, and for our offices out there that deal with clients that are filing with I-10 numbers, uh, the question was ICW2s with conflicting social security numbers from what my client gives me. And um, you know what that's relating to are your clients that have I-10 numbers are working under a fictitious or a made-up social security number. That's what the W-2s are going to come through with. Um, you know what? That's really kind of par for the course for dealing with that, um, that market or with clients that have I-10 numbers. Uh, an I-10 number is an individual taxpayer identification number. Uh, it does not grant uh, that person, client, uh, uh, the ability or the legality uh, to work in the United States. However, it does grant them uh, the ability to file a United States tax return. Um, so, yes, you absolutely will see clients that have I-10 numbers come into your office with W-2s uh, with Social Security numbers on them. Uh, that is not uh, tax identity theft. Uh, your software accounts for that, and you will find that if you are preparing a tax return, uh, 
uh, for a taxpayer or a spouse that has an I-10 number on it, when you get to the W-2, it will ask you to actually type in the Social Security number that is listed on that W-2. Fill that in correctly and accurately, and that will allow for the IRS to allocate that W-2 to the correct worker. Um, in a perfect world, that all gets sorted out on the IRS's side and there are no issues with it. Uh, those of you that file a lot of I-10 returns know that um, actually that's not the case and there is a little bit of follow-up that uh, comes with a percentage of those returns that you file. But uh, that does not mean that you need to, uh, you know, uh, throw up the red flag and, uh, you know, call, uh, call ICE or call uh, the authorities saying that there's identity theft going on and you've got the culprit right in your office. Uh, that's not the case. So I, I hope that um, answers the question there relating to identity theft uh, and SOC numbers being on W-2s for your clients that actually have I-10 numbers. Uh, Another, uh, actually, another another piece of information that uh, one of our partners uh, posted up here throughout the webinar was that their policy at their office uh, is actually to report any identity theft cases they have or have their client do it to um, ICE.gov or uh, I think that's Immigration and, and Customs Enforcement. Uh, with the U.S. government, and they will actually refer that case through to the local city or uh, locality uh, with their financial um, financial crimes unit. So I thought that was something interesting that I hadn't heard before. Um, Derek, do you have anything you want to uh, want to add on to those? Yeah, the uh, the proper attribution of socials to ITINs. I, I mentioned when I do trainings with people that the, the W twos in the software have to match exactly with the uh, the the, the taxpayers or tax preparers holding. Um, when you have an ITIN as the primary or, or a social or, or the secondary on the return, uh, a little slot will light up on every W-2 that has you put the social that's on the W-2 there. Uh, there's no way you can miss it. Uh, it'll need to be filled out in order for that particular form to be good to go for submitting the return electronically. Oh, fantastic. I'm uh, glad to hear that they've uh, uh, kind of stepped up the way that they actually uh, draw attention to that box, that field. That's, uh, that's good to hear. Um, all right, next thing that we've got on here, uh, you know, Derek was mentioning before about uh, how you can help your client liaise with the IRS uh, to help resolve this issue. And uh, you know, we've really, I, I had somebody uh, mention that they've had challenges uh, talking with the IRS on a client's behalf, even with the POA in place. And uh, that's very true. We've had the same challenges here. Um, really, your ability to um, assist your client and, and act as a POA uh, is very, very limited when it comes to identity theft. And the reason being for that is that, um, you know, when there's a POA involved, there's a, a third party that now uh, potentially might be getting the uh, um, getting duped into representing the fraudulent party uh, or the identity thief in this regard. Uh, so really, you can help your client file the uh, uh, form one four zero three nine, help them report identity theft, help them request an identity theft PIN number, um, but really uh, when it comes to uh, helping them navigate the, the process of resolving that, uh, once that is filed, once the case is in place, uh, it is up to the taxpayer uh, to be the, the point man or uh, person when it comes to dealing with the IRS, dealing with the, a revenue agent, and actually uh, getting those necessary documents uh, submitted into the IRS. Um, so I, I hope that uh, that addresses that and gives you guys a little bit of more input on there as well. Um, I, I had somebody uh, request us uh, provide a generic or a miscellaneous police report uh, so that they could have that form handy in their office. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that is uh, something that is related to your local municipality, uh, your you know, state police force, your sheriff's department, uh, that's something that maybe you could contact them and see if they have a standardized or
or a generic uh, form for that miscellaneous report. But uh, as Derek mentioned, that's what really um, solidifies that filing because uh, you reporting it to the IRS, or I guess I should say uh, your client bringing that up to the IRS, addresses it in the tax world, but it does not take it outside of that realm. And uh, as, as I mentioned before, our, our partner that suggested reporting it to uh, through uh, ICE or uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, or through your local uh, police or sheriff's office, uh, that takes it outside of just the tax world and brings it into actual um, criminal uh, prosecution where hopefully they can get that resolved on a larger, um, uh, under a larger umbrella. I guess I should say. So, um, let's see. I had a question here about: uh, Is there a fee for filing the one four zero three nine? No, there is not. Uh, that is uh, something that uh, you actually uh, submit into the IRS. They process on your behalf without any fees associated to it. Um, I got another question here, Derek. That. Uh, you might uh, be able to weigh in on. Uh, the question was, what if you're dealing with a taxpayer that received a PIN number but lost it in between receiving it and the time of tax preparation? Um, to my knowledge, last year they were able to call in and have a second letter uh, that CPO1A sent out. Have you heard anything new for this year uh, regarding uh -huh. that? Yeah, that? That's typically the procedure. Um, the, usually the response time on that is about three days. Uh, there is also a uh, there is also the possibility. Uh, it, it's very rare. Uh, like we're going off like purely anecdotal evidence for like two or three people that that they were able to get the number over the phone after they verified uh, you know their identity sufficiently to that particular agent by like you know bringing up last year's AGI like essentially proving hey I am who I say I am. Uh, I I would not rely on that. They would they would normally be instructed to call. And then get another letter sent out to the address that's on file, and then it would go to their, you know, their address that they get the mail from, and then they would be able to file the return then. All right, great, good deal. Yeah, that uh, uh, I believe it's the uh, 800-829-1040 number that they're uh, stuck calling to get that replacement PIN number uh, as well. Is that uh, your understanding, Derek? Yep. Yep. Okay. So. Uh, 1-800-829-1040, that is the general taxpayer helpline. Um, you know, tell your clients to call early in the morning. The earlier they call, uh, we have found the lesser the wait time is dramatically. Uh, and I believe they open up at 7 o'clock, uh, whatever the actual filing center time is uh, that you're located next to. Uh, I had someone else uh, uh, provide a little bit more information on uh, reporting to uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, and they're saying that you will actually receive a case number uh, for the report when you file that, and um, that generally they will actually push that through uh, to the appropriate department within the related city. Uh, so that's great. That's something that we haven't uh, really uh, used before a tool out there uh, ICE uh, ICE.gov is the uh, website for those guys uh, had somebody ask a question as far as how do you get paid as the tax preparer if your client has been the victim of identity theft do you get paid once the IRS clears them and funds their return excellent question and uh, yeah, the way that uh, the way that I'm going to answer that is is with uh, there, there's a little caveat in there, and identity theft cases um, sometimes take a long time to resolve. Derek kind of touched on this uh, during the presentation, but uh, really, I've seen these things take uh, eight months before on a couple of them for clients that we've had here, um, and throughout that process, it is very possible that a bank product return will get switched over to a paper check being mailed to the client's uh, address listed on the tax return. So if you have this, there is no guarantee that uh, you're going to get paid through a bank product. If you are working with your client, if you are helping them, hopefully uh, when they get their refund, perhaps you could collect from them. Uh, but I would say it's about... Um, I'd say it's about 80% that usually do get funded, get issued through to a bank product. Derek, do you have any uh, experience with those, and what are your thoughts? 
Well, like, uh, identity theft does not automatically always mean that a social was used and locked up. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, they might find out because of a later uh, a letter that comes to them from an earlier tax uh, situation. So as long as you're not getting a current rejection uh, with the uh, Social Security number for that particular taxpayer uh, locked up, uh, then it's possible to do a bank product. If you've got somebody that's doing, um, you know, taking the kids or claiming them and it is an identity theft issue, uh, you can always do a bank product without the dependents and collect some of your fees and then do an amendment to add the kids on so the taxpayer gets the rest of their money. So you get paid for the initial tax prep. You provide the amendment, usually uh, I'd say gratis most times, and uh, get that taken care of for them along with the 14039. And as long as their social security number is not being prevented from being filed electronically, you should be able to do a bank product. Because it's not always that case when it's an identity theft issue. Yeah, and something else, I guess, I uh, that there's another side of that there um, that that I didn't catch. And just because your client brings you an identity theft PIN number, that does not have any bearing on the funding of that return. If they bring you a PIN number. That usually means that the return is going to process through quickly uh, and that they've kind of protected themselves against any type of identity theft related delays moving forward for that year. So um, if your client brings you that PIN number, that is not an indicator that uh, you know, you're in for a delay. Um, that usually means that, uh, fantastic, uh, those issues have been resolved, and this year it should be smooth sailing. Uh, so you should get paid in a timely fashion, and there really shouldn't be too many delays behind it. Um, so I, I wanted to mention that as well. Uh, I've had somebody ask me, are we allowed to charge a fee for helping clients resolve their tax identity theft problems? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we live in a uh, capitalist society here, so uh, you can absolutely charge a fee for your, your time, your services, and, uh, you know, uh, the filling out of the form uh, 14039 uh, is, is something that uh, I, I would say is perfectly legitimate. Um, you know, as far as a suggested fee for that, I wouldn't say you want to charge too much because really you want to. Uh, you know, this is something that is going to help solidify a relationship between you uh, and your tax customers and your clients. Uh, this is kind of one of those going over and above to help them out of a situation that's a, a pretty crummy one. Um, so maybe you could tack on a fee when you're actually filing their return for, um, I don't know, Derek, what do you think? 25 bucks is probably a, a pretty fair uh, price for that. I think that... Uh, to my recollection, that that one four zero three nine is only two pages long. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's um, I think it's three. I think it's three pages long. Um, yeah. Charging a fee uh, is is perfectly fine, especially if you're offering it as a separate service. I'd imagine. Uh, but you, like you said, it, it can help build trust between you and, and the client. So, I mean, obviously you want to get paid for your services. If they're coming in to do the taxes, you want to get paid for it. And if the e-filing prevents them from doing that, you know, maybe you could work something out and, uh, you know, on a purely case-by-case -case basis or whatever. Uh, so that, that's pretty much my advice on it. Yeah. Um, I got another question on here that uh, that's a great one that really uh, affects everybody here. Um, the, the question or statement is that I have a client who told me that her friend had accessed her, her kids' social security numbers and she's worried that she might run out and claim them. Uh, how do you protect a dependent's social security number? Well, that is a fantastic question because um, currently there is only a spot on the tax return for the primary taxpayer's um, identity theft pen number. Uh, so there is nothing there relating to dependents and how to protect those dependents. Uh, Derek mentioned before that there is a kind of first come first serve uh, when it comes to the IRS e-file. Uh, so traditionally it is get them in and have them file quickly. Uh, you got anything that uh, anything new that they've came up, come up with Derek for dependents in that situation? Not really new but more of, of a piece of advice. If you have somebody that's uh, you know, claim like her friend, you know, I'll use quote fingers for that, her friend might potentially go claim the kids, that friend will lose against the IRS extremely quickly if the taxpayer attempts to question it at all. So if her friend goes and files 
uh, you know, with her kids, all that she has to do is simply contest it with like maybe a paper file and explain the scenario, and that friend could face some very serious penalties, very serious jail time, and in a worst case scenario, the IRS can bar somebody from claiming EIC on their return for two or even ten years, so her friend might run the risk of losing the ability to legitimately claim her own EIC for a ten year period. And that misses out on you know thousands of dollars a year of potential uh, potential refunds that they might have just because they wanted to add another kid to their return. Yeah, good point. It's pretty easy to prove relationship when they are your kids, and uh, you know if it's a neighbor, a friend, uh, you know acquaintance, or just somebody you don't even know, uh, you can't get EIC if you don't have the relationship element there for a dependent. So that means that uh, this person or friend that we are uh, putting in the fictitious quote marks here uh, is lying on their tax return, is fraudulently saying that it's their son or daughter, uh, nephew, niece, brother, sister, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and that is something that during that process, like Derek said, you know, you can either file the return without the dependents initially and then do an amendment to put them back on and start an investigation or you could just do a paper file and start that investigation immediately. Um, you know, that will be a quick solve if your client is the legitimate um, mother, father, parent um, of those uh, kids. So, uh, I had uh, somebody mention in here that they personally were a victim of identity theft and they second the the idea of getting a police report. They said that uh, really you are dead in the water without that police report regarding resolving that issue outside of a, a tax um, tax area. So um, seconded on that motion there. Um, Derek, that's the last question I had coming in here. You got anything else you want to add on there that we didn't cover? Uh, I guess sort of just kind of echoing the um the, the police report, uh, we mentioned it in the slide, we mentioned the, the case study. Uh, I have uh, several people that I know that are in the middle of uh, identity theft issues, either tax or non-tax related, and without that police report, not a single person is going to take you seriously at all. They're, you know, as, as far as they're concerned, especially for bill collectors where it is a problem, uh, you know, this is, that's just another excuse someone has for not wanting to make payments on some sort of debt that they owe. So police report is the only way you're going to be able to only be able to get taken seriously, and the penalty for filing a false police report is usually enough deterrent that most people will believe you by virtue of the fact that you're not going to go file a fake police report to justify it. Because that's just digging your uh, digging your own hole for the identity theft person. Uh, the identity theft market is a very vibrant market and it's very saturated. Uh, right now, it's so easy to get a social that it's only about fifteen dollars in terms of real money cost in order to buy a person's identity and use it for whatever you want. So, well, hey guys, that's a scary thought, but uh, it's a very serious topic that we're covering tonight. Um, uh, we've had some good information here. Uh, we will get the uh, PowerPoint slides posted up in the Partner Portal as well as an archived version of the webinar. Uh, so if you want to uh, take a look at it again or if you have any staff that weren't able to join us live tonight, we'll get that up there here. Uh, we'll try to get it up by this weekend. Uh, we usually have these up within 48 hours of the live broadcast. Uh, but I'd like to thank everybody. Derek, thank you. Great presentation. And uh, we'll talk to everybody here soon. Uh, Derek, anything else, last words from you before we get out of here? Yeah, uh, something that just popped in my mind. Uh, when filing a police report, it's possible that the person who committed the identity theft is a related party or a close friend, and the person might be hesitant to file a report. Uh, not that I would recommend doing a, like a false police report considering the, the problems associated with it, but filing a miscellaneous police report in many cases does not institute uh, some sort of investigation. And in a lot of cases, uh, you know, that means that you know, they can put a block on whatever is going on with the finances. They can put a block on the, on the tax return, and it doesn't automatically just throw someone that they're very close with in jail. Uh, so you know, if you have someone that says, oh, I don't want to do it, uh, well, you can go fill out a miscellaneous police report. As long as the paper's there, it will help you out. It doesn't automatically mean that you know, your, your uh, brother or sister that used your social to grab a, uh, a Walmart credit card is going to get tossed in the slammer. Yeah, good so point. Well, hey, guys, uh, again, thanks for your time tonight. We appreciate it. We'll get this posted up in the Partner Portal here shortly. Everybody have a uh, great night, great weekend, and uh, look forward to hearing from everybody soon. Bye-bye.